Adam and Eve were the first of Heavenly Father's children to live on earth. They lived in the beautiful Garden of Eden, surrounded by all sorts of plants and trees. God, our Heavenly Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ visited them and talked to them. God let them eat the fruit of every tree but one. If they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they would have to leave the garden and would eventually die. Satan lied to Adam and Eve. Satan said if they ate the fruit, they would know good and evil, but they would not die. Eve chose to eat the fruit. Eve gave Adam some of the fruit. He also chose to eat it. God and the Lord visited them, but Adam and Eve were afraid and hid. God asked if they had eaten the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve told God that they chose to eat the fruit. Because of their choice, they had to leave the Garden of Eden. They were separated from God, but He had a plan for them. Now they knew right from wrong and could have children. Adam and Eve promised to obey all of God's commandments. They were taught to make animal sacrifices. As they obeyed, they learned more about God's Son, Jesus Christ. They both felt great joy because He would help their family return to God. A great council in heaven was once convened in which it seems that all of us participated. There, our Heavenly Father announced His plan. The enabling essence of the plan is the atonement of Jesus Christ. As it is central to the plan, we should try to comprehend the meaning of the atonement. But before we can understand it, however, we must understand the fall of Adam. And before we can fully appreciate the fall, we must first comprehend the creation. These three events, the creation, the fall, and the atonement, are three preeminent pillars of God's plan, and they are doctrinally interrelated. Our most fundamental doctrine includes the knowledge that we are children of a living God. That is why one of His most sacred names is Father, Heavenly Father. This doctrine has been clearly taught by prophets through the ages. When tempted by Satan, Moses rebuffed him, saying, Who art thou? For behold, I am a son of God. Addressing Israel, the psalmist proclaimed, All of you are children of the Most High. Paul taught the Athenians on Mars Hill that they were offspring of God. Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon received a vision in which they saw the Father and the Son, and a heavenly voice declared that the inhabitants of the worlds are begotten sons and daughters unto God. In 1995, the 15 apostles, living apostles and prophets affirmed all human beings are created in the image of God. Each is a beloved spirit, son, or daughter of heavenly parents. And I, God, created man. Male and female created I them. This was done spiritually in your premortal existence when you lived in the presence of your Father in heaven. Your gender existed before coming to earth. You elected to have this earthly experience as part of His plan for you. The prophets call it the plan of mercy, the eternal plan of deliverance, the plan of salvation, and yes, the great plan of happiness. You were taught this plan before you came to earth, and there rejoiced in the privilege of participating in it. Obedience to the plan is a requisite for full happiness in this life and a continuation of eternal joy beyond the veil. Essential to his plan of happiness is agency, the right of personal choice. Our understanding of life begins with a council in heaven. There, the spirit children of God were taught his eternal plan for their destiny. We had progressed as far as we could without a physical body and an experience in mortality. To realize a fullness of joy, we had to prove our willingness to keep the commandments of God in a circumstance where we had no memory of what preceded our mortal birth. 
In the course of mortality, we would become subject to death and we would be soiled by sin. To reclaim us from death and sin, our Heavenly Father's plan provided a Savior whose atonement would redeem all from death and pay the price necessary for all to be cleansed from sin on the conditions he prescribed. Satan had his own plan. He proposed to save all the spirit children of God, assuring that result by removing their power to choose and thus eliminating the possibility of sin. When Satan's plan was rejected, he and the spirits who followed him opposed the Father's plan and were cast out. Revelation tells us that there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. <clears throat> what a perilous time that must have been. The Almighty himself was pitted against the sun of the morning. We were there while that was going on. That must have been a desperately difficult struggle with a grand triumphal victory. Concerning those desperate times, the Lord spoke to Job out of the whirlwind and said, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Why were we then happy? I think it was because good had triumphed over evil and the whole human family was on the Lord's side. We turned our backs on the adversary and aligned ourselves with the forces of God, and those forces were victorious. But having made that decision, why should we have to make it again and again after our birth into mortality? I cannot understand why so many have betrayed in life the decision they once made when the great war occurred in heaven. All of the myriads of mortals who have been born on this earth chose the Father's plan and fought for it. Many of us also made covenants with the Father concerning what we would do in mortality. In ways that have not been revealed, our actions in the spirit world influence us in mortality. Although Satan and his followers have lost their opportunity to have a physical body, they are permitted to use their spirit powers to try to frustrate God's plan. This provides the opposition necessary to test how mortals will use their freedom to choose. Satan's most strenuous opposition is directed at whatever is most important to the Father's plan. Satan seeks to discredit the Savior and divine authority, to nullify the effects of the Atonement, to counterfeit revelation, to lead people away from the truth, to contradict individual accountability, to confuse gender, to undermine marriage, and to discourage childbearing, especially by parents who will raise children in righteousness. Be fruitful and multiply. This commandment was first in sequence and first in importance. It was essential that God's spirit children have mortal birth and an opportunity to progress toward eternal life. When Adam and Eve received the first commandment, they were in a transitional state, no longer in the spirit world, but with physical bodies not yet subject to death and not yet capable of procreation. They could not fulfill the Father's first commandment without transgressing the barrier between the bliss of the Garden of Eden and the terrible trials and wonderful opportunities of mortal life.
The fall wasn't a disaster. It wasn't a mistake or an accident. It was a deliberate part of the plan of salvation. We are God's spirit offspring, sent to earth innocent of Adam's transgression, and yet our Father's plan subjects us to temptation and misery in this fallen world as the price to comprehend authentic joy. Without tasting the bitter, we can't understand the sweet. We require mortality's discipline and refinement as the next step in our development toward becoming like our Father. But growth means growing pains. It also means learning from our mistakes in a continual process made possible by the Savior's grace, which He extends both during and after all we can do. The Prophet Joseph Smith taught, The priesthood is an everlasting principle and existed with God from eternity. Christ is the great high priest, Adam next. So the priesthood was first given to Adam. He obtained the first presidency and held the keys of it in the creation before the world was formed. President Brigham Young said, Priesthood is the law by which the worlds are, were, and will continue forever and ever. Thus priesthood is the power of God. Its ordinances and covenants are to bless men and women alike. Eve was created when her body was made by God. Adam exclaimed, Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. From the rib of Adam, Eve was created. Interesting to me is the fact that animals fashioned by our Creator, such as dogs and cats, have 13 pairs of ribs. But the human being has one less, with only twelve. I presume another bone could have been used, but the rib, coming as it does from the side, seems to denote partnership. The rib signifies neither dominion nor subservience, but a lateral relationship as partners to work and to live side by side. Adam and Eve were joined together in marriage for time and all eternity by the power of that everlasting priesthood. Eve came as a partner to build and to organize the bodies of mortal men. She was designed by deity to co-create and nurture life that the great plan of the Father might achieve fruition. Eve was the mother of all living. She was the first of all women. From our study of Eve, we may learn five fundamental lessons of everlasting importance. One, she labored beside her companion. Two, she and Adam bore the responsibilities of parenthood. Three, she and her partner worshiped the Lord in prayer. Four, she and Adam heeded divine commandments of obedience and sacrifice. And five, she and her husband taught the gospel to their children. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, all that they needed for daily sustenance was abundantly given to them. They had no difficulties, challenges, or pain. Because they had never experienced hard times, they did not know they could be happy. They had never felt turmoil so they could not feel peace. Eventually, Adam and Eve transgressed the command to not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. By so doing, they were no longer in a state of innocence. They began to experience principles of opposition. They began to encounter sickness that weakened their health. They began to see, feel sadness as well as joy. Through Adam and Eve's partaking of the forbidden fruit, knowledge of good and evil was introduced into the world. Their choice made it possible for each of us to come to this earth and be tried and tested. We are blessed with agency, which is our ability to make decisions 
and to become accountable for those decisions. The fall made possible in our lives feelings of both happiness and sadness. We were able to understand peace because we feel turmoil. Our Father in Heaven knew this would happen to us. It's all part of His perfect plan of happiness. He prepared a way through the life of His perfectly obedient Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, for His atonement to overcome every difficulty that we may experience in mortality. We live in trying times. I need not list all of the sources of evil in the world. It is not necessary to describe all the possible challenges and heartaches that are a part of mortality. Each of us is immediately aware, intimately aware, of our own struggles with temptation, pain, and sadness. We were taught in the pre-mortal world that our purpose in coming here is to be tested, tried, and stretched. We knew we would face the evils of the adversary. Sometimes we may feel more aware of the negative things of mortality than we are of the positive. The prophet Levi taught, Ehi taught, for it must be that there is an opposition in all things. Despite all of the negative challenges we have in life, we must take time to actively exercise our faith. Such exercise invites the positive, faith-filled power of the Atonement of Jesus Christ into our lives. God's plan gives us four great assurances to assist our journey through mortality. All are given to us through the Atonement of Jesus Christ, the centerpiece of the plan. The first assures us that through His suffering for the sins of which we repent, we can be cleansed of those sins. Then the merciful final judge will remember them no more. Second, as part of our Savior's atonement, he took upon him all other mortal infirmities. This allows us to receive divine help and strength to bear the inevitable burdens of mortality, personal and general, such as war and pestilence. The Book of Mormon provides our clearest scriptural description of this essential power of the atonement. The Savior took upon him Quote, the pains and sicknesses and infirmities of his people. He will take upon him their infirmities that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. End of quote. Third, the Savior, through his infinite atonement, revokes the finality of death and gives us the joyful assurance that all of us will be resurrected. The Book of Mormon teaches, quote, This restoration shall come to all, both old and young, both bond and free, both male and female, both the wicked and the righteous, and even there shall not so much as a hair of their head be lost, but everything shall be restored to its perfect frame. End of quote. We celebrate the reality of the resurrection in this Easter season. This gives us the perspective and strength to endure the mortal challenges faced by each of us and those we love, such things as the physical, mental, or emotional deficiencies we acquire at birth or experience during our mortal lives. Because of the resurrection, we know that these mortal deficiencies are only temporary. The restored gospel assures us that the resurrection can include the opportunity to be with our family members, husband, wife, children, and parents. This is a powerful encouragement for us to fulfill our family responsibilities in mortality. 
It helps us live together in love in this life in anticipation of joyful reunions and associations in the next. Fourth and finally, modern revelation teaches us that our progress need not conclude with the end of mortality. Little has been revealed about this important assurance. We are told that this life is the time to prepare to meet God and that we should not procrastinate our repentance. Still, we are taught that in the spirit world the gospel is preached even to the wicked and the disobedient who had rejected the truth and that those taught there are capable of repentance in advance of the final judgment. When difficult things occur in our lives, what is our immediate response? Is it confusion or doubt or spiritual withdrawal? Is it a blow to our faith? Do we blame God or others for our circumstances? Or is our first response to remember who we are? that we are children of a loving God, is that coupled with an absolute trust that he allows some earthly suffering because he knows it will bless us, like a refiner's fire, to become like him and to gain our eternal inheritance. Recently, I was in a meeting with Elder Jeffrey R. Holland in teaching the principle that mortal life can be agonizing, but our e hardships have eternal purpose, even if we do not understand it at the time, Elder Holland said, you can have what you want or you can have something better. From the day of Cain to the present, the adversary has been the great mastermind of the terrible conflicts that have brought so much suffering. Treachery and terrorism began with him and they will continue until the Son of God returns to rule and reign with peace and righteousness among the sons and daughters of God. Through centuries of time, men and women, so very, very many, have lived and died. Some may die in the conflict that lies ahead to us, and we bear solemn testimony of this. Death will not be the end. There is life beyond this as surely as there is life here. Through the great plan which became the very essence of the war in heaven, men shall go on living. Now, brothers and sisters, we must do our duty, whatever that duty might be. Peace may be denied for a season. Some of our liberties may be curtailed. We may be inconvenienced. We may even be called on to suffer in one way or another. But God, our eternal Father, will watch over this nation and all of the civilized world who look to Him. He has declared, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Our safety lies in repentance. Our strength comes of obedience to the commandments of God. Let us be prayerful. Let us pray for righteousness. Let us pray for the forces of good. Let us reach out to help men and women of goodwill, whatever their religious persuasion and wherever they live. Let us stand firm against evil, both at home and abroad. Let us live worthy of the blessings of heaven, reforming our lives where necessary and looking to him, the Father of us all. He has said, Be still and know that I am God. In our increasingly secular society, it is as uncommon as it is unfashionable to speak of Adam and Eve, or the Garden of Eden, or a fortunate fall into mortality. Nevertheless, the simple truth 
is that we cannot fully comprehend the atonement and resurrection of Christ, and we will not adequately appreciate the unique purpose of his birth or his death. In other words, there's no way to truly celebrate Christmas or Easter without understanding that there was an actual Adam and Eve who fell from an actual Eden with all the consequences that fall carried with it. I do not know the details of what happened on this planet before that. But I do know these two were created under the divine hand of God, that for a time they lived alone in a paradisical setting where there was neither human death nor future family, and that through a sequence of choices, they transgressed a commandment of God which required that they leave their garden setting, but which allowed them to have children before facing physical death. To add further sorrow and complexity to their circumstance, their transgression had spiritual consequences as well, cutting them off from the presence of God forever. Because we were then born into that fallen world, and because we too would transgress the laws of God, we also were sentenced to the same penalties that Adam and Eve faced. What a plight! The entire human race in freefall. Every man, woman, and child in it physically tumbling toward permanent death, spiritually plunging toward eternal anguish. Is that what life was meant to be? Is this the grand finale of the human experience? Is our only purpose in life an empty existential exercise, simply to leap as high as we can, hang on for our prescribed three score years and ten, and then fail, then fall, and keep falling forever? The answer to those questions is an unequivocal and eternal no. With prophets ancient and modern, I testify that all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. Thus, from the moment those first parents stepped out of the Garden of Eden, the God and Father of us all, anticipating Adam and Eve's decision, dispatched the very angels of heaven to declare to them and down through time to us that the entire sequence was designed for our eternal happiness. It was part of his divine plan, which provided for a Savior, the very Son of God himself, another Adam, the Apostle Paul would call him, who would come in the meridian of time to atone for the first Adam's transgression. That atonement would achieve complete victory over physical death, unconditionally granting resurrection to every person who has been born or ever will be born into this world. Mercifully, it would also provide forgiveness for the personal sins of all, from Adam to the end of the world, conditioned upon repentance and obedience to divine commandments. As one of his ordained witnesses, I declare this Easter morning that Jesus of Nazareth was and is that Savior of the world, the last Adam, the author and finisher of our faith, the Alpha and Omega of eternal life. The information in this presentation is taken from the Old Testament lesson material for various church classes and videos, all provided by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Salt Lake City, Utah, unless otherwise noted.